This announcement is for our church family only. If you would like to give your regular tithes and offerings, you may do so in one of two ways. One, you can bring the offering to the church. Or two, you can give online at the link shown on the screen.
In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
to be in your house on a Friday night. It is not part of our normal routine, but for me, it is a joy to be here worshiping you. I truly, truly, truly sense your presence this evening. And quite honestly, I would just like to stay with my face in the carpet right now, just enjoying and basking in you. Father, I thank you and I praise you for who you are. I thank you for what you have done for us, in us, and through us over these last number of days and months. And I anticipate, God, that you're going to do something really cool this weekend. And so we thank you for this opportunity. We ask, God, your, that your blessing would be on this. And then we ask that your unction would fill your servant and that the words of his mouth would be the words that you want us to hear this weekend. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Just by giving you a little bit of, of, of understanding of what's going on, uh, you've heard the term COVID, right? You've heard that? Yeah. Well, the, the, the expression for, for me for 2020 is, but COVID. Because I was supposed to be in Camp Maranatha, but COVID. I was supposed to be with my brothers and sisters, fellow pastors and their spouses, but COVID. I haven't had a chance to see any of my brothers and sisters for almost a year because of COVID. And the, the one thing that's really cool, though, that COVID didn't take away from us this year, because God had a purpose, was almost a year or more we had planned this weekend. Um, what had happened was, um, Reverend Tanner is from Indiana. He and his wife, I just found out yesterday while we were having lunch, actually come up to Fairbanks quite frequently, because they have a son, daughter-in-law, and grandchildren who live in Fairbanks. And so when they were asked, uh, a long time ago, if he would be the guest speaker at what was going to be the Pastors and Spouses Retreat that starts this week, but COVID, um, the, the DS said, well, listen, what we'll do is we'll fly you into Fairbanks. You get to spend a week or so with your family. Then you'll drive on Monday down to Anchorage with Pastor Brad and his wife, and then we'll go to the Pastors and Spouses Retreat, and then we'll fly out of Anchorage. So we're like, yeah, that's great. So he has an itinerary that brings him to Fairbanks, but he has to fly out of Anchorage. And so what's ended up happening is this event still was able to take place. Originally, it was planned that we were going to do uh, Friday night at North Pole, Saturday night at Fairbanks First Church, and then Sunday morning at our church. But because of COVID and uh, concerns over not being able to, you know, people didn't want to get out. We said, we'll take it. And so uh, Reverend Tanner has agreed to be here all three times for us. And so we are blessed. At the same time, <clears throat> um, he still has to drive out on Monday. So be in prayer for his family as they're traveling on Monday because um, they're still going to be driving down the park side. We can fly out Tuesday, right? So, um, but I'm excited. Uh, we gave you a little bit of their background last on Sunday. But just to give you just a short recap, Reverend Tanner um, is a retired pastor. He pastor of the Valparaiso Church of the Nazarene in Indiana for over 25 years. Um, he is now on what's called Pastor Emeritus status, which means that he is still on staff, on, on, on staff there, but they let him fly out and travel the world literally to speak. He has spoken all around the world, and yesterday he told us that he, uh, he is a, 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 a speaker for cruise lines, and he's actually traveled the world on the cruise lines dime last year. I mean, this whole, for long years and years and years. So the end result is, that this man has years and years and years, more than a quarter of a century of experience of preaching, and his whole ministry is to build up the body, to build up Christians wherever he goes. And he told us when he wanted to come here that that's exactly what, what he wanted. He said, this is not an evangelistic rally. Don't go out and beat the bushes trying to get those sinners to go to church on Friday night. This is for Christians. I want to just help the body of Christ grow and be encouraged and be strengthened. And so I'm excited about what God's going to do and, th do and say through Reverend Tanner. And with that, I'm going to turn it over. No, I think I won. Yes or no? I think you go okay. That was quite an introduction. Oh, I'm good. <laughs> uh, frankly, it, I, I have been very fortunate. I have had the chance to, to speak literally around the world. And I was thinking, I guess the first time I had a French horn solo. I love that. That was, that was pretty cool. Uh, communication 101. In order to Communicate to a crowd. The first question you have to ask, do they care? 
Listen, if you don't care about the subject, you can't be good enough, you can't be funny enough, you can't be creative enough. There's got to be a subject that we say, okay, we really care about. And as you think about it, a lot of those Bible stories, they're incredible. I mean, Lazarus come out of the dead? I mean, how, how incredible is that? I wasn't there. I, there's teaching there, but I wasn't there. The parting of the Red Sea, the Hebrew nation goes through on dry land. How incredible is that? I wasn't there. So I'm wondering, is there anything we can talk about where you're there, where you're participating now? Not, not a story we learned from in the Holy Scriptures of events that happened, you know, centuries ago. Is there something happening right now that you're involved in right now that therefore you care about and it's relevant? There's a battle in the heavens. It's the invisible battle, and it's spiritual warfare, and you're involved. You're involved right now. And you might say, well, I, you know, I've heard about that. I'm not sure I believe it. Your belief is not important. I, I'm, I'm not trying to be unkind. There's a spiritual warfare going on, and you're involved. And the more we understand, the more encouraged we are. It is uplifting to us to understand it. But it is such a deep subject that in point of fact, we're never going to leave it for three sessions. Tonight, tomorrow, and Sunday morning. We're going to kind of un unpack it a little bit. And, and frankly, yeah, it's kind of deep. And there's a famous quote by Mark Twain. Somebody asked him, what do you do with all the, all the scripture you can't understand? Mark Twain said, I'm more worried about what I do understand. There's an awful lot about warfare that we do understand. And the more we grasp, the better it is. So let's begin with the big picture. What do you think about heaven? Is there such a place? Is it beyond our imagination? Is it light and, and precious stones and streets of gold and pearly gates and, and eternity? Do you understand eternity? i got to tell you the truth. I don't. I understand things that start and stop. I can't wrap my mind around unending. I, I, I can't. Whatever eternity is, what's your view of heaven? And sometimes people miss the biblical truths about heaven. Have you ever thought of heaven in terms of multiple places? Or at least multiple levels? Not just a single place? Well, that's not up for question. That's a biblical truth. We know there are either multiple heavens or multiple layers of heaven. Okay, so where do you know that? Let me read 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 2, 3, and 4. I know a man in Christ who was taken to the third heaven. I don't know whether this man was in his body or not, but God knows. He heard things he cannot ex explain, and no humans allowed to tell. So we know there's three. He was taken to the third heaven. Are there more? Who knows? Maybe. But eternally, the followers of Christ, death is not the end. I walk through the, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. 23rd Psalm, remember that whole passage? I walk through death into eternity, whatever that is. This stuff is, is beyond our imagination. We've got to focus on what we know. One thing we understand clearly, we're a spirit. You're a spirit. I'm a spirit. This body isn't me. You're looking at me going, thank God for that. Right back at you. <laughs> we're housed in a body. The real spirit of Jim Tanner is... is Emotional, my highs are high, my lows are low, I'm creative, I, 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 my, my spirit is different than yours. I'm Jake Tanner, but I'm housed in this body. And every time Jesus is asked about eternity, he dodges the question. It's almost frustrating. It's like politicians who are great at ignoring the question. The, 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 debates, the, the debate's coming up. I, I love to watch them because no matter what question you throw, they'll answer for a second and then bang, right to talking points. Whenever Jesus was asked about, about death, he always responded the same way. Follow me. Well, that's not the question. And then I read something that made this all for once became clear. You've got to use your imagination because it's obviously impossible. You're a speed lumper. You, you, you go into caves. And you went to a cave nobody has ever been in before. Farther than anybody else. And you saw a human being, an adult, who was born and raised in that cave. I know. How? What do you eat? All that stuff. How do you learn language? I get it. Use your imagination. This person has been inside this cave, and you say, you've been in this cave all this time? Yeah, this is it. So you've never seen the sun? What's, what's the sun? Well, it, it, it's this 
bright orange. Oh, it's orange. But it gives off heat in the sky. What's heat? What's sky? You have the words to explain what it's like to be out of that cave. There's no way they can comprehend it. At some point, don't you give up and say, come here, follow me. It's beyond your imagination. I've spent my entire life in the cave of this body. I don't know what it's like. Jesus had the words to explain what it's like to actually be out of the body going into eternity. But we couldn't, we couldn't possibly grasp it. And he comes along and he makes a statement repetitively. And it's the key to everything. Seek ye first the kingdom. The Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come. We were created that we might live kingdom. People say, I can't figure out the meaning of life. I mean, I go to work, I come home, it's got to be more to it. Than, yes, 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 there is more to it than that. You and I are created only for one reason. To live kingdom that God receives glory. You're going to hear that a lot this weekend. I am created that God receives glory. I, as I live kingdom, every, every day of my life that God receives glory, everything else is a symptom. How I am as a dad, how I am as a husband, how I am as a grandfather, how I am at work, how I, my character, my ethics, all comes back to I live my life that God receives glory. Now, these multiple heavens, we see it a lot. This is not, when I read 2 Corinthians, that's not a unique verse. Listen carefully to Revelation 8.13. I looked and I heard an angel flying through mid-heaven in a loud voice, woe to the inhabitants of earth, because the remaining blasts are yet to be sounded. A little bit further, a little further in Revelation 14.6. I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those that dwell on earth. For there to be a mid-heaven, there's got to be more than one heaven. It's kind of common sense comes into play, doesn't it? If there's a mid-heaven, there's got to be other heavens. So, the judgment bar, again, who can grasp this stuff? The judgment bar, whatever it is, exists, and it's not who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. That's already established. It's about the crowns. Now, I don't think it's the literal crowns, but it's the rewards. It's the decision of where we will spend eternity. Now, I'm convinced, I know my reward is not close to St. Paul's, but I really believe it's going to be better than deep on the cross. The reciprocal is true, therefore. Because everything biblically has a reciprocal. If there are multiple layers of heaven, then therefore, there has to be multiple layers of hell. For instance, someone that, that's, a, that's a, a good man, a good woman, never brought Christ in their life. But the fact of the matter is, this is a good person. They're moral, they, they love their kids, they raise their kids, they pay their taxes, they were good citizens, they were, they were good neighbors, they were on a school board, whatever. They were good, good people. This never went past in their life. Their eternal hell is different than Hitler's. Like the bottom line, God is, God is just. With this big picture, we can begin to talk more seriously. Satan's singular goal is to rob God of glory. End of story. His only goal, we're created for the glory of God. Satan's only mission, as we understand the big picture of this stuff, is to rob God of glory. Robbing God of why we were created. Satan's ultimate weapon, single weapon, is accusations. Do you realize the name Satan literally means the accuser? Revelation 12, 10. Satan, the accuser of the brethren, accuses them before God day and night. Somehow, and again, who can grasp this stuff, huh? Satan has access to God. And he does this so that he can be the accuser. He comes to God and names you by name. He names me by name. And says, by the way, did you know what Jim Tanner did today? You didn't get glory out of that. He names you by name. And says, you know what so-and-so did today? You didn't get glory there. He makes accusations by name. It's personal. Revelation 12, 10, Satan, the accuser of the brethren who accuses them before God night and day. Scripture makes clear. Let's fast forward. End of time. Satan will be cast out of heaven. But until that happens, buckle up. He rules earth. We've got to be realistic about him here. He roams the earth constantly. Job chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. There was a day when the sons of God, angels, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came with them. And the Lord said to Satan, Satan, where have you come from? 
And Satan answered from walking to and fro on the earth. On earth today, it's a world of war, strife, hatred, riots. Do you accept this stuff as normal? You haven't gotten used to it? The earth belongs to Satan. Remember when Jesus was tempted in, in the desert? The second temptation, Jesus comes to him and says, I tell you what, worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth. You know what bothers me? Jesus doesn't correct him at this point. Because Satan owns all the kingdoms of the earth. Doubt it? Watch the news tonight. Who cares who? Where are the riots today? So Satan has a control level on earth. And followers of Jesus, us, have to be prepared to deal with this conflict because there is an invisible war going all the time. We care because you are in it. You are the front lines. And Satan wants you to totally ignore biblical truth about this. He wants you to float downstream of life. Pretend it's not a big deal. Satan just wants you so busy in your life that you almost ignore the reality of eternity. So busy in your life, good things, that we almost ignore, I'm in the front lines of this battle. And it's real. And you're involved. The, the wording of Scripture, listen carefully to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to give you verses 3, 4, and 5. For though we live in this world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, if we have power to demolish strongholds, we demolish arguments, every pretension that sets itself up in knowledge of God, we take captive all of our thoughts and make it obedient. I read it fast. I talk fast. Listen fast. But you notice the words there? War, weapons, demolish, captive, strongholds. This is a war and you are the front lines. And Satan loves you to be clueless. Now, one thing we need to understand is encouragement. Those serving Christ are not on the defensive or the offensive. He's trying to stop us, not the other way around. I love Matthew 16, 18. I will build my church and the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. That's me and you. The gates of hell cannot prevail against two rivers or, or Fairbanks first or North Pole. The gates of hell cannot prevail against us. Now, yes, Satan has a level of control on earth, but eternally we win. So living here is not the end all. You ever notice Paul, the relationship of Paul and Timothy as a father and son? Now, they're not biblical father and son, but these guys, Tim, Timothy so loves Paul, and Paul's been mentoring Timothy. All these letters to Timothy from Paul are so ranked in love. Listen to what Paul says to Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. Excuse me, verses 3 and 4. You must endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ. No one engages in wealth and warfare, entangles himself in, the, in life. We must please him who has enlisted us as a soldier. Paul, to his beloved Timothy, is basically saying, you ain't a civilian. A soldier cannot act like a civilian. You can't live like other people. You have a spiritual calling. You're set apart. You're at war. Now, Satan, of course, wants to downplay this. Just float through life. Just pay your bills. Be a good person. He loves the clueless. Ephesians 6.12 We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, <clears throat> powers, rulers of darkness of age, against the host of wickedness in heavenly places. Again, though, did you notice how it ended? In heavenly places. Plural. We wrestle. This is not a gimme. We wrestle. So the real Christian life isn't, isn't tiptoeing through the tulips. It's not harps and music. And if you believe it's going to be that way, you're a pretty easy mark for the enemy. Every follower of Christ must understand warfare is your experience and you're not a civilian. Even the warning in Scripture about our commander, the Father, God, you ever notice when they're walking through the parted red seas, they, 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 they come out of Egypt, we're coming to the party of the Red Seas, and what are they chanting? Ephesians 15, 3. The Lord is a man of war, and the Lord is his name. You say, yeah, okay, I, I hear you, but I'm not really involved because, frankly, I like this church, and I like the people here, but I'm not really serving Christ. You're involved. 
You, you are involved. Because Satan is using your life to accuse you of everything you're doing so that you don't live giving God glory. The only reason you were created was that God received glory. And therefore, I live my life daily that God receive glory. That's kingdom living. We know the war began with rebellion. So when we come to Jesus, we're basically saying, I no longer want to rebel against you. And God comes along and says, all those who come to me, I will give you peace. Real peace. Isaiah is the promise, 57, 19. I will give peace. Real peace, those far and near, I will heal them, says the Lord. But the next verse is interesting. That was 57, 19. The next verse, he says, those who refuse to come. But in 57, 19, let's go right over verse 57, 20. But the wicked are like a troubled sea that cannot rest. And the waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says God, for the wicked. Pastor Bob had mentioned that I have one of the greatest hobbies on earth. I get to speak for cruise lines. I teach a Christian service on, on, on cruise lines. And so for 35 years, Tammy and I have spent so many, so many, so many cruises. They talk about storms at sea. It all is so rare. They're really good at, at nowadays knowing what a storm isn't going around it. It's one in a million they gotta go through the storm. One time in 35 years of cruising, Tammy and I had to go through a storm. And I think our deck was seven or eight decks above the water, and we had a porthole. And it looked like a washing machine, the water, that the waves were coming up and splashing around. You couldn't walk. Not to be gross, but they had bags tight to all the stairwells. These people got sick. We would, we'd crawl. You couldn't stay in your room. It was just, you just, just never stopped. I went out and stepped on deck with everybody else just in the open air. Because it, it, I thought, if you could just stop for half an hour and let me catch my breath. If you could just stop this movement for half an hour and let me get my legs out of If you could just stop for a little bit, it'd be okay. But all night, that thing kept going. I kept thinking, this wasn't in a brochure. <laughs> so I, I think I, I, I've experienced that no peace. Without Christ, there are people who have good jobs and they're good people. But real peace, peace not in their gut. Peace not in their soul. They're hungry for it. And they're naive. They're serving Satan. They just don't know it. But there's nothing neutral here. You're either serving Christ or you're not. There's no third party here. There are no options. You either in or out. And Satan calls their name night and day in accusation, saying, There's someone you created and they're not giving you glory. There's someone you created and they're not following you. There's someone you created and I have robbed you of the glory. So, where did the war begin? We'll get into it a little deeper tomorrow night. Like it began in heaven, but how did it get to us? Let's talk about how, how did it get to us? How were we involved? Genesis chapter 3 tells us, Lucifer, that Satan, appeared to Adam and Eve, the human parents of all of us. You know the story. God had given them the garden and said, it's all yours, not that one tree. Satan gets them to forget the entire garden and focus on one tree. He's good at that. He knows how to get us to ignore all the blessings that focus on one thing. They ignored this gigantic garden, and all of a sudden, that one tree they had to have. Now, eating the fruit's not the issue. It really isn't. Joining Satan in rebellion, that's the issue. Discovering disobedience, that's the issue. And the spiral of human events spiraled down from there. I think sometimes people make the mistake of seeing the Bible as a condensed history of the universe. It's not. Simply put, it's the history of a certain man named Adam and his descendants. All other episodes of history are included in the Bible only because they help us deal understanding how God deals with Adam and his descendants. That's me and you. How God deals with me and you. The story begins with this tremendous statement that can never lose its impact. Genesis 1, 1. You know what it says, don't you? God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning... God created in the beginning. Okay. Whose beginning? Not God's. It was was. It's our beginning. It's the story, the beginning of our story. Adam's race. God created, so he has authority. I either align myself with his authority or I reject his authority. No third option. This is big picture stuff. The meaning of life 
as I live that God receive glory. My decisions, my behavior, who I am. Now we have evidence of episodes that are important to us before creation. God always was. Things happened before he created us. Things happened before he created the earth. One of my favorite stories is, is Job. He's unhappy. He, well, that's kind of, he's ticked. He's had with the way God's running things. And in the midst of this, in his complaining, he says, God, I need to talk to you. Well, God comes along. And God lays into Job. Job 38, 4 to 7. This is God speaking. Job, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me. Who determined its measurements? Who stretched the line? Where was its foundations? Who laid the cornerstones? And the morning stars sang. And they shouted for joy. Talking about putting God in his place. Who are you to tell me how to run the universe? Did you build this thing? And those morning stars singing for joy? It's obviously angels. Angels witnessed God creating us and they shouted for joy. Eternity passed. The theologians call things that happened before the earth and before our creation, eternity passed. Something else happened in eternity past. Jesus says himself. Luke chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus says, I saw Satan falling like lightning out of heaven. That's God's judgment on an archangel named Lucifer. Satan. Satan occupied a place very close to the throne. He occupied a place of incredible power. And above that, he was beautiful. Theologians believe Satan was the most beautiful thing God ever created. Wait a second here. Satan? Beautiful? I've seen the pictures. Red cape. Tails, horns, ugly. I've seen all the horror movies. Satan's ugly. Not so, my friends. We have a picture of Satan. But God said to him, him is Satan, Ezekiel 28, 12 to 15, you were the seal of perfection. This is the enemy. Full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. Yikes. You were the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the turquoise, the emerald with gold. Workmanship of your triples and pipes were prepared for you the day you were created. You were anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were the holy mountain of God. You went back and forth of iron stones. You were perfect in your ways. You were created. Wow. Till iniquity was found in you. So, this feeling that Satan is this horror movie, ugly creature, not so. Satan, theologians believe, is the single most beautiful thing God ever created. Satan understands beauty. It also says he has wisdom. Now, it's perverted as evil, but he's not stupid. In fact, have you ever noticed all the things the Bible talks about Satan? He's this, he's that, all the adjectives, not one time ever in the entire Bible does it ever call him stupid. He's perfectly wise, but he's wise. He was beautiful. He is beautiful, but he's nothing more than a created being. So why did he why did he rebel in the first place? Pride motivated him to challenge God and claim a price equal with God. Apparently, this Lucifer, Satan, had authority over a tremendously large amount of angels who remained loyal to him in this rebellion. They also discovered disobedience. And God cast him and all those that followed him, a third of all the angels followed him and they were cast out of heaven. How did Satan convince a third of the angels to follow him? The Bible tells us. It's amazing all the stuff the Bible actually tells us. It says he traded. Now, in the Old Testament Hebrews, that means tail bearer. Or slander, or remember Satan's name means slander. Ezekiel 28, 16. By the abundance of your trading, your slander, you became filled with violence and sin. You defiled the sanctuary by the multitude of your iniquities. And the iniquity of your trading, can you hear can you see him? To a third of the angels, to all those under his authority. He had authority over a third of the angels. How many is that? A billion, a trillion, a hundred? Who, who could guess? He's working it. You don't have the you don't have the recognition you deserve from the founder. Your position is beneath your ability. He doesn't see you. He doesn't appreciate your gifts. 
He doesn't know your potentials. If only I was in charge, I would use you to the level that you could be used. Oh, I promote you. Now, this didn't happen overnight. We have no way to measure how long Lucifer traded and kept the bombardment going under those angels under his care until the revolt happened. They were all thrown out of heaven. He persuaded a third of the angels. Time out. Let's back it up. How do you know it was a third? It's amazing what the Bible tells us. Revelations 12, 4. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and they were thrown to earth. Again, how many is that? Beats me. How many angels are there? Beats me. But a third of them are part of the rebellion. All this happens in eternity past. But it didn't end the rebellion. Satan takes this rebellion to earth. Introduces it to Adam and Eve. And so therefore, after all of that, you're in the battle. You're in the front lines. The battle is about you. To Adam and all his descendants. And temptation is always a false beauty. Frankly, if it was ugly, we'd be tempted. If it was stupid, we wouldn't be tempted. We're not dumb. If it made no sense at all, we wouldn't be tempted. He has a way of making evil look beautiful and getting our focus on that only. Remember, a gigantic garden, all Adam and Eve cared about was one tree. He has a way of making the evil beautiful. Because Satan understands beauty. He is a beautiful creature. He draws our attention. You're saying, yeah, he did that with Adam and Eve, but he's still doing it today. Why doesn't he change his tactics? Because it still works. Why on earth would you change something that's still working? I wasn't great, but I, I played high school football, and we had a couple of plays, and our coach always said, until they stop it, we keep running it. If they can't stop it, there's no reason for us to stop running the V, the V, or whatever. If we don't stop him, what makes you think he's going to stop himself? He's still the traitor, the master of slander, and he talks to the Father about you and me. This is not a war about you, it's a war of you. He seeks to undermine God's authority with our lives, in the church, and the world. Satan got them to forget the entire garden and focus on a tree. It's been said, Satan begins with a simple lie and builds momentum from there. Satan says to us, this is all a fairy tale. Continue to rebel. People don't even know they're rebelling. You don't know we're at war. And the war is you. Satan loves the clueless. What's more unaffected than an army soldier that always in a war? Does God receive glory from my life? Becomes the first night question. In my behavior, in my decisions, does God receive glory from my life? That's a tough question. And the, the second part of that question, kind of the whiplash, if God's not receiving glory, then who is? You know that answer, don't you? That's right. Welcome to the meaning of life. People try to figure out the meaning of life, I just gave it to you. You are on this planet. You were created solely that God receives glory from you. The problem is, we can't give glory to God and Satan at the same time. Only one of us going to give glory. Now the conflict began, I said, with pride. Let's back that up scripturally. Satan's beauty got to him. Ezekiel gives us so much about eternity past. Ezekiel 28, 17, speaking about Satan. Your heart was lifted up. You, in other words, you became proud. Because of your beauty, you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. He was so beautiful, he thought he could overtake God. And again, it talks about his wisdom. Never assume the enemy is stupid. It's a wisdom that's perverted, but it's wisdom. You were created to give God glory. And we must live our life every day. God, are you receiving glory from this, from this decision, from this behavior? Are you, am I given over to you? Or is Satan really effective in going before God the Father and saying, let me tell you what Gene Tanner did today. You didn't get any glory there. Tomorrow night, I want to build off this. Let me give you a shocking statement. Creation happened because of the war. You were created only because of the rebellion. That was the first domino. 
Creation of human beings is because of the war. He's thinking, you back that up? Yeah, we will. So we're on our, in the second time, you've got to peel back and peel back and peel back. Sunday morning, Daniel gives us an explicit account of a 21-day battle between angels in heaven. And Daniel lays out for these 21 days how angels fought over us. I hope you don't miss this session. I really hope you don't. Because I think you'll come out with a, with a encouragement, with a passion, and recognize there's so much more going on here than just going to church. There's so much more going on here. I don't want us to just learn. I want us to grow with the power of the reality of why I'm on this planet and what God is trying to do here in Fairbanks and North Pole. Let me have a word of prayer with you. Think about, who am I going to call and invite tomorrow night? At the beginning, I'm going to give a two-second recap of what we did tonight so people come around and don't feel like I, I, I came into halfway through a movie. I'm going to give a real short recap and bring them up to speed and we'll get into why human beings were created in the first place and why it was because of the, of the, of the rebellion and how we go from there. For the three sessions, one down, two to go. We're going to, we're going to appeal this if you can make all three, you'll have a very clear understanding, I really believe, of what warfare is and who I am. I want to turn it over to Pastor Bob. Let me have a prayer with you. Father, we're not here to impress anybody. We really have that time. But we want to reveal truth. And sometimes truth isn't kind. It's a myth that truth is always kind. Sometimes truth is hard. But we need to learn who you are, who we are. These passages of Scripture, you told us so that we would know. You, you want us to know what's going on. You want us to strive. You want us to win. You want us. You want us. And Father, there may be some that are saying, I have not lived for you. I haven't. I'm so thankful that you died on the cross for me. Forgive me. I didn't know it was in war. Forgive me. Let me begin a, a journey with you that I really give you glory because of my life. Because that's why I'm on this earth in the first place. Father, I thank you for the peace of your spirit that we can sense as we gather together tonight. We pray for your power as we continue in our weekend. We ask this in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Pastor, Pastor Bob. For those of you who uh, do know about our YouTube channel, um, Lord willing, this will be processed overnight and uploaded to our YouTube channel by noon tomorrow. So if you do invite somebody and they say, well, I wish I'd seen them last night, you can tell them just to go to the Two Rivers Community Church of the Nazarene on YouTube and the video will be ready by tomorrow afternoon. So that they can, re it's only gonna be 30 to 35 minutes for them to watch and they're fully caught up and they can come tomorrow night and not feel like they've missed anything at all. Um, so thank you guys for coming and uh, be in prayer for what God's gonna do for the next few days and uh, think about somebody that should have been here tonight that maybe could come tomorrow night. All right, let's be dismissed. Lord, we thank you, we give you praise. I've been encouraged. I've heard things tonight that in 40 plus years of ministry, I mean, of uh, following you, and uh, 17 years of ministry, I've never heard before. So I thank you, Father, for the growth that I've even experienced this evening, and I'm encouraged and excited about what you're going to be doing in my heart over the next couple of sessions. Bless us now as we go to our homes. Keep us safe on the road, and bring us back here tomorrow night safely. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Be blessed. Yeah. So when I called you, I think you said,